So good morning, Melbourne. Can you hear me? So you, uh, it's great to be back in Melbourne. You, you um, should be proud that uh, you're the most livable city in the world. I think of Melbourne there as a place with the greatest coffee in the world. Uh, you should be proud of that as well. Um, for this audience, uh, I don't think we have to deal with the basics. I think we're, we're here to talk about cities. I think you all know that we're living in a rapidly urbanizing world. Half the people in the world live in cities, predicted the 70% will by 2050. 300 million rural Chinese will move to the cities over the next 15 years, which means we have to build in China the equivalent infrastructure of the entire U.S., things like that. So we won't go over that. Um, I, I also won't talk uh, about green buildings, I, because I think largely we know how to do that. That's not the big challenge. I think, I think we're, uh, we're looking at uh, how we can dramatically increase the livability of cities while at the same time reduce resource consumption, how to move away from private automobiles, which I think is a very dysfunctional pattern, how we can uh, increase the utilization rate of of uh, buildings, parking facilities, et cetera, in our cities, how we can bring urban food production directly into the city, how we can use new technology to make uh, life better for people. Uh, and we, we like to start with people. So this is, uh, this is how settlements formed, more or less, one of the patterns that gathered around a scarce resource like a well. And the size of that settlement was limited to how far, for example, that woman could walk with a pot of water on her head, which was about something like a half kilometer reasonably. That made the settlement pattern about a kilometer in diameter. And you see this all over the world. If you fly over Germany or India, you see these villages. They tend to uh, be no more than a, uh, a kilometer in diameter, a 20-minute walk in diameter. And if you, uh, if you look at medieval, I love maps, so I've been collecting a lot of maps. This is. Uh, a map of an early medieval city. You can see there's higher density in the center. There's orchards and food productions within the wall and then fields beyond that that, uh, that fed the city. And you literally find hundreds and hundreds of these, uh, these, these, these uh, medieval villages with similar patterns. They were kind of the ultimate human scale uh, settlement because it was before machines. They were designed for people rather than machines. And then it all changed. So with industrialization, Factories were dirty and noisy. They moved to the outskirts of the city. Production became centralized, as did energy production. Uh, learning and well, healthcare became uh, concentrated in hospitals and learning in schools. You had sewer networks, other networks that allowed for uh, urban settlements to become larger. Uh, eventually, they were connected by streetcars and trains. And then the car hit, the mass production of the car in 1908, and basically everything changed. We, particularly in the U.S., went car crazy. And <laughs> so infrastructure for cars started to dominate thinking about the needs of people. This is uh, what we did in Boston, where I live. We took this beautiful historic city, cut this huge scar through the city for the interstate. Fortunately, we've taken it down uh, just recently. Uh, this, this was the original, I think, dysfunctional settlement pattern, uh, L.A. This is the model <laughs> that we, we, we are following. And whether you're in Mexico City or Riyadh, I took this out the window of my hotel last year, or Guangzhou, where it's just higher density tower sprawl, but really the same thing. Similar patterns. Pollution is out of control. I don't know how many of you have been to Beijing recently. I've been there maybe four times in the last year, and it is um, a not a livable place on an on a average day. Uh, you have uh, traffic congestion in Beijing. I took this out the window of my cab in Beijing, and again, this was a pretty good day. If you, if you um, look at that sign up there, you'll see it's green and yellow. There's no red. On a bad day, you have red on that sign. The poor people, by the way, were zipping along on the bike lanes, passing the middle class and rich people in their Audis. Uh, we have, if you look at what happens in central cities, we waste a tremendous amount of, the la of land to uh, parking. Everything red is a parking lot or a parking deck in Houston, a particularly bad example, but it, it's similar in most cities. Then we're building these new ghettos. They may be high-priced housing, but they're single-purpose ghettos, entirely dependent on the automobile, with, with the lacking the diversity of functions. 
Uh, density is an issue that we're very concerned with. Uh, this is a uh, this is a, a kind of a simplified uh, result of a study that shows that as uh, cities increase in size, millions of people, and you and uh, you have a normalized scale for these these items, you can see that the good things and the bad things tend to go in parallel. So, GDP patents and R and D investment goes up pretty much in parallel with AIDS cases. And, and crime. So cities with dense urban cores tend to have more skilled people, higher wages, more innovation, more investment in the arts and technology, much lower water and energy consumption per capita, but it also tends to bring, if you don't do it right, more noise, congestion, pollution, loss of contact with nature, crime, drug use, and disease. So basically, we're, we're, uh, one of the things we're looking at is can you have the good stuff without the bad stuff with density. This is a study by a Singapore group, not surprisingly, because they're shown as the best up there. If you look at density compared to livability, I don't think Melbourne's on this, on this chart. The numbers are a little screwy because we, we're more interested in the central cities. Some of the, the political jurisdictions are so big it's, it skews the... Uh, the density calculation, but nonetheless, I, I think what this reveals is you can do density well or you can do it, you can do density poorly. So can we have the good stuff, like in Paris, Paris is actually central Paris, very high density city, without uh, the bad stuff like you find in Bangalore in this case. Okay, so that's my brief history of cities and where we are. What I mostly want to talk about are the urban interventions that we've been developing in our group. So this is kind of a personal presentation in that this work is work that my little group of about 30 people are working on. First idea is to create cities of micro cities, much like those earlier diagrams. This is nothing new. The new urbanists have been talking about this for a long time. But where you, you have neighborhoods where places of living, work, culture, shopping are all within a 20 minute walk rich diversity of interactions. Uh, in Cambridge, where I work, you walk along the red line, you have Kendall Square Central, Harvard Square, um, Ail uh, Porter Square, Alewife, they're all about a mile apart, that same 20 minute walk, the same pattern you see in Paris, series of neighborhoods that are about 20 minute walk in size. Uh, and Paris is very interesting because uh, it reveals, I think, a highly functional pattern in that you have an even distribution of the things that people need in their daily life. Like every dot there is a cafe or shops or Paris physicians or pharmacies. In China, they tend to put the hospital district in the corner and that tends to be where all the pharmacies and medical facilities are. I think a healthy community has a very distributed pattern. So our, our concept for creating cities is you, you, you create more or less a, uh, a mesh network, kind of internet topology uh, for cities where you, you have a series of these higher density neighborhoods constrained in size, linked by mass transit, those red dots, and then within each neighborhood you have most of what you need in life and uh, available to you within a few minute walk. Melbourne actually is, is pretty good in that sense. Maybe we take the cars around the perimeter, we find places for them to drop the cars because within each of these areas you don't need, uh, you don't need a private car.